Chapter Seven, Part Two of A Chronicle of Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. A Chronicle of Wolf, by William Wood. Chapter Seven, Part Two. That afternoon of the twelfth, while Montcalm and Vaudreuil were at cross purposes near the mouth of the Saint Charles, Wolf was only four miles away on the other side of the plains in a boat on the St. Lawrence, where he was taking his last look at what he then called the Foulon, and what the world now calls Wolf's Cove. His boat was just turning to drift up in midstream, off Sillery Point, which is only half a mile above the Foulon. He wanted to examine the cove well through his telescope at dead low tide, as he intended to land his army there at the next low tide. Close beside him sat young Robeson, who was not an officer in either the army or the navy, but who had come out to Canada as tutor to an admiral's son, and who had been found so good at maps that he was employed with Wolfe's engineers in making surveys and sketches of the ground about Quebec. Shutting up his telescope, Wolfe sat silent a while. Then, as afterwards recorded by Robeson, he turned towards his officers and repeated several stanzas of Gray's elegy. Gentlemen, he said as he ended, I would sooner have written that poem than beat the French to-morrow. He did not know then that his own fame would far surpass the poet's, and that he should win it in the very way described in one of the lines he had just been quoting. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. At half-past eight in the evening he was sitting in his cabin on board Holmes's flagship, the Sutherland, above Cap Rouge, with Jackie Jervis, the future Earl St. Vincent, but now the youngest captain in the fleet, only twenty-four. Wolfe and Jervis had both been at the same school at Greenwich, Swindon's, though at different times, and they were great friends. Wolfe had made up a sealed parcel of his notebook, his will, and the portrait of Catherine Lowther, and he now handed it over to Jervis for safekeeping. But he had no chance of talking about old times at home, for just then the letter from the three brigadiers was handed in. It asked him if he would not give them distinct orders about the place or places we are to attack. He wrote back to the senior, Monckton, telling him what he had arranged for the first and second brigades, and then separately to Townsend about the third, which was not with Holmes but on the south shore. After dark the men from the island and the point of levy had marched up to join this brigade at Etchemin, the very place where Wolfe had made his plan on the tenth, as he stood and looked at the Foulon opposite. His last general orders to his army had been read out some hours before, but of course the Foulon was not mentioned. These orders show that he well understood the great issues he was fighting for, and what men he had to count upon. Here are only three sentences, but how much they mean. The enemy's force is now divided. A vigorous blow struck by the army at this juncture may determine the fate of Canada. The officers and men will remember what their country expects of them. The watchword was Coventry, which, being probably suggested by the saying, sent to Coventry, that is, condemned to silence, was as apt a word for this expectant night as Gibraltar, the symbol of strength, was for the one on which Quebec surrendered. Just before dark, Holmes sent every vessel he could spare to make a show of force opposite Point Notre-Dame, in order to hold Bougainville there overnight but after dark the main body of Holmes' squadron and all the boats and small transports came together opposite Cap Rouge. Just before ten, a single lantern appeared in the Sutherland's main topmost shrouds. On seeing this, Chads formed up the boats between the ships and the south shore, the side away from the French. In three hours every man was in his place. Not a sound was to be heard except the murmur of the strong ebb tides setting down towards Quebec and a gentle southwest breeze blowing the same direction. All ready, sir, and Wolfe took his own place in the first boat with his friend Captain Delone, the leader of the twenty-four men of the forlorn Hope, who were to be the first to scale the cliff. Then a second lantern appeared above the first, and the whole brigade of boats began to move off in succession. They had about eight miles to go, but the current ran the distance in two hours, as they advanced they could see the flashes from the levee batteries growing brighter and more frequent, for both the land-gunners there and the seamen-gunners with saunders further down were increasing their fire as the hour for Wolfe's landing drew near. A couple of miles above the Foulon the hunter was anchored in midstream. As arranged, Chads left the south shore and steered straight for her, 
To his surprise he saw her crew training their guns on him, but they held their fire. Then Wolfe came alongside and found that she had two French deserters on board who had mistaken his boats for the French provision convoy that was expected to creep down the north shore that very night and land at the Foulon. He had already planned to pass his boats off as this convoy, for he knew that the farthest up point of Holmes's men-of-war had stopped it above pointe aux Trembles. but he was glad to know that the French posts below Cap Rouge had not yet heard of the stoppage. From the hunter his boat led the way to Sillery Point, half a mile above the Foulon. "'Halt! Who comes there?' a French sentry's voice rang out in the silence of the night. "'France!' answered young Fraser, who had been taken into Wolfe's boat because he spoke French like a native. "'What's your regiment?' asked the sentry. "'The Queen's,' answered Fraser, who knew that this was the one supplying the escort for the provision boats the British had held up. "'But why don't you speak out?' asked the sentry again. "'Hush!' said Fraser. "'The British will hear us if you make a noise.' And there, sure enough, was the hunter, drifting down as arranged, not far outside the column of boats. Then the sentry let them all pass, and in ten minutes more, exactly at four o'clock, the leading boat grounded in the Anse Foulon, and Wolfe jumped ashore. He at once took the forlorn hope and two hundred light infantry to the side of the cove towards Quebec, saying as he went, "'I don't know if we shall all get up, but we must make the attempt.' Then, while these men were scrambling up, he went back to the middle of the cove, where Howe had already formed the remaining five hundred light infantry." Captain MacDonald, a very active climber, passed the forlorn hope, and was the first man to reach the top and feel his way through the trees to the left, towards Vorgor's tents. Presently he almost ran into the sleepy French-Canadian sentry, who heard only a voice speaking perfect French and telling him it was all right, nothing but the reinforcements from the Beauport camp. For Wolfe knew that Montcalm had been trying to get a French regular officer to replace Vorgor, who was as good a thief as Bigot and as bad a soldier as Vaudreuil. While this little parley was going on, the forlorn hope came up, when MacDonald promptly hit the sentry between the eyes with the hilt of his claymore, and knocked him flat. The light infantry pressed on close behind. The dumbfounded French colonial troops coming out of their tents found themselves face to face with a whole woodful of fixed bayonets. They fired a few shots. The British charged with a loud cheer. The Canadians scurried away through the trees and Vergor ran for dear life in his nightshirt. The ringing cheer with which Delone charged home told Wolfe at the foot of the road that the actual top was clear. Then Howe went up. In fifteen minutes all the light infantry had joined their comrades above. Another battalion quickly followed, and Wolfe himself followed them. By this time it was five o'clock and quite light. The boats that had landed the first brigade had already rowed through the gaps between the small transports, which were landing the second brigade and had reached the south shore, a mile and a half away, where the third brigade was waiting for them. Meanwhile, the suddenly roused gunners of the Samos battery were firing wildly at the British vessels, but the men of war fired back with better aim, and Howe's light infantry, coming up at a run from behind, dashed in among the astonished gunners with the bayonet, cleared them all out, and spiked every gun. Howe left three companies there to hold the battery against Bougainville later in the day, and returned with the other seven to Wolfe. It was now six o'clock. The third brigade had landed. The whole of the ground at the top was clear, and Wolfe set off with one thousand men to see what Montcalm was doing. Quebec stands on the eastern end of a sort of promontory, or narrow tableland, between the St. Lawrence and the valley of the St. Charles. This tableland is less than a mile wide, and narrows still more as it approaches Quebec. Its top is tilted over toward the St. Charles and Beauport, the cliffs being only one hundred feet high there, instead of three hundred as they are beside the St. Lawrence. So Wolfe, as he turned in towards Quebec, after marching straight across the tableland, could look out over the French camp. Everything seemed quiet, so he made his left secure, and sent for his main body to follow him at once. It was now seven. In another hour his line of battle was formed. His reserves had taken post in his rear, and a brigade of seamen from Saunders' fleet were landing guns, stores, blankets, tents, and trenching tools, and whatever else he would need for besieging the city after defeating Montcalm. The three thousand soldiers on the beach were anything but pleased with the tame work of waiting there while the soldiers were fighting up above. One of their officers, in a letter home, said they could hardly stand still, 
and were perpetually swearing because they were not allowed to get into the heat of the action. The whole of the complicated manoeuvres, in face of an active enemy, for three days and three nights, by land and water, over a front of thirty miles, had now been crowned by complete success. The army of five thousand men had been put ashore at the right time and in the right way, and it was now ready to fight one of the great immortal battles of the world. The Thin Red Line The phrase was invented long after Wolfe's day, but Wolfe invented the fact. The six battalions which formed his front, that thirteenth morning of September, 1759, were drawn up in the first two-deep line that ever stood on any field of battle in the world since war began. And it was Wolfe alone who made this thin red line, as surely as it was Wolfe alone who made the plan that conquered Canada. Meanwhile Montcalm had not been idle, though he was perplexed to the last, because one of the stupid rules in the French camp was that all news was to be told first to Vaudreuil, who, as governor-general, could pass it on or not, and interfere with the army as much as he liked. When it was light enough to see Saunders' fleet, the island of Orleans, and the point of Levy, Montcalm at once noticed that Wolfe's men had gone. He galloped down to the bridge of boats, where he found that Vaudreuil had already heard of Wolfe's landing. At first the French thought the firing round the Foulon was caused by an exchange of shots between the Samos battery and some British men of war that were trying to stop the French provision boats from getting in there. But Vergor's fugitives, and the French patrols near Quebec, soon told the real story. And then, just before seven, Montcalm himself caught sight of Wolfe's first redcoats marching in along the St. Foy road. Well might he exclaim, after all he had done, and Vaudreuil had undone, there they are, where they have no right to be. He at once sent orders, all along his six miles of entrenchments, to bring up every French regular, and all the rest except two thousand militia. But Vaudreuil again interfered, and Montcalm got only the French and Canadian regulars, twenty-five hundred, and the same number of Canadian militia, with a few Indians. The French and British totals, actually present on the field of battle, were therefore almost exactly equal, five thousand each. Vaudreuil also forgot to order out the field guns, the horses for which the vile and corrupt Bigot had been using him for himself. At nine, Montcalm had formed up his French and colonial regulars between Quebec and the crest of rising ground across the plains, beyond which lay Wolfe. Riding forward till he could see the redcoats, he noticed how thin their line was on its left and in its centre, and that its right, near the St. Lawrence, had apparently not formed at all. But his eye deceived him about the British right, as the men were lying down there, out of sight, behind a swell of ground. He galloped back, and asked if any one had further news. Several officers declared that they had heard that Wolfe was entrenching, but that his right brigade had not yet had time to march on to the field. There was no possible way of finding out anything else at once. The chance seemed favourable. Montcalm knew that he had to fight or starve as he was completely cut off by land and water, except for one bad swampy road in the valley of the St. Charles, and he ordered his line to advance. At half-past nine the French reached the crest and halted. The two armies were now in full view of each other on the plains, and only a quarter of a mile apart. The French line of battle had eight small battalions, about twenty-five hundred men, formed six deep. The colonial regulars, in three battalions, were on the flanks. The five battalions of French regulars were in the centre. Montcalm, wearing a green and gold uniform, with the brilliant cross of St. Louis over his cuirass, and mounted on a splendid black charger, rode the whole length of his line to see if all were ready to attack. The French regulars, half-fed, sorely harassed, and interfered with by Vaudreuil, were still the victors of Ticonderoga, against the British odds of four to one. Perhaps they might snatch one last desperate victory from the fortunes of war? Certainly all would follow wherever they were led by their beloved Montcalm, the greatest Frenchman of the whole new world. He said a few stirring words to each of his well-known regiments as he rode by, and when he laughingly asked the best of all, the Royal Roussillon, if they were not tired enough to take a little rest before the battle, they shouted back that they were never too tired to fight. Forward! Forward! And their steady blue ranks, and those of the four white regiments beside them, with bayonets fixed and colours flying, did indeed look fit and ready for the fray. Wolfe had also gone along his line of battle, the first of all two deep thin red lines, 
to make sure that every officer understood the order that there was to be no firing until the French came close up to within only forty paces. As soon as he saw Montcalm's line on the crest, he had moved his own a hundred paces forward, according to previous arrangement, so that the two enemies were now only a long musket shot apart. The Canadians and Indians were pressing round the British flanks, under cover of the bushes, and firing hard. But they were easily held in check by the light infantry on the left rear of the line, and by the thirty-fifth on the right rear. The few French and British skirmishers in the centre now ran back to their own lines, and before ten the field was quite clear between the two opposing fronts. Wolfe had been wounded twice when going along his line, first in the wrist, and then in the groin. Yet he stood up so straight and looked so cool that when he came back to take post on the right, the men there did not know he had been hit at all. His spirit already soared in triumph over the weakness of the flesh. Here he was, a sick and doubly wounded man, but a soldier, a hero, and a conqueror, with the key to half a continent almost within his eager grasp. At a signal from Montcalm in the centre, the French line advanced about a hundred yards in perfect formation. Then the Canadian regulars suddenly began firing without orders, and threw themselves flat on the ground to reload. By the time they had got up, the French regulars had halted some distance in front of them, fired a volley, and began advancing again. This was too much for the Canadians. Though they were regulars, they were not used to fighting in the open, not trained for it, and not armed for it with bayonets. In a couple of minutes they had all slunk off to the flanks, joined by the Indians and militia, who were attacking the British from under cover. This left the French regulars face to face with Wolfe's front. Five French battalions against the British six. These two fronts were now to decide the fate of Canada between them. The French still came bravely on, but their six-deep line was much shorter than the British two-deep line, and they saw that both their flanks were about to be overlapped by fire and steel. They inclined outwards to save themselves from this fatal overlap on both right and left. But that made just as fatal a gap in their centre. The whole line wavered, halted oftener to fire, and fired more wildly at each halt. In the meantime, Wolfe's front stood firm as a rock and silent as the grave, one long, straight, living wall of red, with the double line of deadly keen bayonets glittering above it. Nothing stirred along its whole length, except the Union Jacks waving defiance at the fleur-de-lis, and those patient men who fell before a fire to which they could not yet reply. Bayonet after bayonet would suddenly flash out of line and fall forward, as the stricken redcoat, standing there with shouldered arms, quivered and sank to the ground. Captain York had brought up a single gun in time for the battle, the sailors having dragged it up the cliff and run it the whole way across the plains. He had been handling it most gallantly during the French advance, firing showers of grape-shot into their ranks, from a position right out in the open in front of Wolfe's line. But now that the French were closing, he had to retire. The sailors then picked up the drag-ropes, and romped in with this most effective six-pounder at full speed, as if they were having the greatest fun of their lives. Wolfe was standing next to the Louisbourg grenadiers, who this time were determined not to begin before they were told. He was to give their colonel the signal to fire the first volley, which then was itself to be the signal for a volley from each of the other five battalions, one after another, all down the line. Each musket was loaded with two bullets and the moment a battalion had fired it was to advance twenty paces, loading as it went, and then fire a general, that is, each man for himself, as hard as he could, till the bugles sounded the charge. Wolfe now watched every step the French line made. Nearer and nearer it came, a hundred paces, seventy-five, fifty, forty, fire! Crash came the volley from the grenadiers. Five more volleys rang out in quick succession, all so perfectly delivered that they sounded more like six great guns than six battalions with hundreds of muskets in each. Under cover of the smoke, Wolfe's men advanced their twenty paces and halted to fire the general. The dense, six deep lines of Frenchmen reeled, staggered, and seemed to melt away under this awful deluge of lead. In five minutes their right was shaken out of all formation. All that remained of it turned and fled, a wild, mad mob of panic-stricken fugitives. The centre followed at once, but the Royal Roussillon stood fast a little longer, 
and when it also turned it had only three unwounded officers left, and they were trying to rally it. Montcalm, who had led the centre, and had been wounded in the advance, galloped over to the Royal Roussillon as it was making this last stand, but even he could not stem the rush that followed and that carried him along with it. Over the crest and down to the valley of St. Charles his army fled, the Canadians and Indians scurrying away through the bushes as hard as they could run. While making one more effort to rally enough men to cover the retreat, he was struck again, this time by a dozen grape-shot from York's gun. He reeled in the saddle, but two of his grenadiers caught him and held him up while he rode into Quebec. As he passed through St. Louis Gate, a terrified woman called out, "'Oh, look at the Marquis! He's killed! He's killed!' But Montcalm, by a supreme effort, sat up straight for a moment and said, "'It is nothing at all, my kind friend. You must not be so much alarmed.' And saying this, passed on to die, a hero to the very last. In the thick of the short, fierce firefight, the bagpipes began to skirl. The Highlanders dashed down their muskets, drew their claymores, and gave a yell that might have been heard across the river— in a moment every British bugle was sounding the charge, and the whole red living wall was rushing forward with a roaring cheer. But it charged without Wolfe. He had been mortally wounded just after giving the signal for those famous volleys. Two officers sprang to his side. "'Hold me up,' he implored them. "'Don't let my gallant fellows see me fall.' With the help of a couple of men he was carried back to the far side of a little knoll, and was seated on a grenadier's folded coat while the grenadier who had taken it off ran over to a spring to get some water. Wolfe knew at once that he was dying, but he did not yet know how the battle had gone. His head had sunk on his breast, and his eyes were already glazing, when an officer on the knoll called out, "'They run! They run! Egad! They give way everywhere!' Rousing himself as if from sleep, Wolfe asked, "'Who run?' "'The French, sir!' Then I die content, and almost as he said it, he breathed his last. He was not buried on the field he won, nor even in the country that he conquered. All that was mortal of him, his poor, sick, wounded body, was borne back across the sea, and carried in mourning triumph through his native land. And there, in the family vault at Greenwich, near the school he had left for his first war, half his short life ago, he was laid to rest on November 20th, at the very time when his own great victory before Quebec was being confirmed by Hawke's magnificently daring attack on the French fleet, amid all the dangers of that wild night in Quiberon Bay. Canada has none of his mortality. But could she have anything more sacred than the spot from which his soaring spirit took flight into immortal fame? And could this sacred spot be marked by any words more winged than these? Here died Wolfe, victorious. End of chapter 7, part 2